Welcome to the Digital Forester Podcast, where we talk to foresters about how they are using digital technologies in their day-to-day forestry work. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Digital Forester Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Stephen Hawks. He's the VP of Forest Resources at Landvest. Steve, how are you doing today? Doing well, Kevin. Thank you. Good stuff. And where are we, where are we reaching you today? I know you're a busy guy and traveling all over the place. Are you at home catching your breath or are you on the road? Uh, I'm in my office in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. Nice. Concord, New Hampshire. Perfect. Good stuff. So thanks for joining. And I'm pretty excited to have this conversation with you because I've known you for a few years. We've had lots of conversations and you're one of those executives that also comes from a technical background and has been in the industry for a really long time. So it's going to be really neat to leverage your experiences, you know, and your observations and where you see things going. But maybe to kick us off, uh, I believe Penn State uh, University was your alma mater in uh, BC in forest science. But maybe how did you get into it? Is it something that was in the family and the DNA or it was just uh, a summer experience or something? But maybe tell us your journey on how you got into forestry. Yeah, I, I think it's in the DNA. Uh, it's uh, interestingly, uh, my father worked for a, a paper company, Mead. Uh, he was not a forester. He was uh, an executive for Mead in their Washington, uh, D.C. office. But before that, uh, my step-grandfather was a paper scientist at Mead, and, and actually he and his team developed a color reproduction process uh, where the ink was imprinted on, impregnated on the paper and different quantities of light were used to explode those ink capsules uh, to do uh, color reproduction. Uh, unfortunately, it, that technology got passed up by quicker and cheaper uh, technologies and it never really uh, made it to market. Uh, and but uh, you know my my father or my grandfather on my mother's side was also a, an agriculture teacher in in the south so I think that's really where I I got it in the DNA um, and uh, but my father being in forest policy I heard him talk about the issues that were related to forestry uh, through you know at the dinner conversations and that got me inspired to become a forester I actually started out uh, studying computer engineering. At uh, Penn State, and decided that that was not the path I wanted to continue. And when I made the, the switch to forestry, it was really a natural fit, and uh, never looked back from there. But that you know, the, the interesting computer engineering sort of gave me my technical background that uh, that allows me to communicate. I don't get to use the tech like I used to, but uh, but it allowed me to communicate with those that that do and develop the tech. So. Yeah, very cool, very cool. You know, it's kind of funny because a lot of people I've chatted with the uh, very. Uh, the true digital foresters, if there is such a thing with a very strong technical background, it seems like there's a pattern where at some point they were, you know, dabbling with computer science or some type of engineering and then just saw better or maybe had a different calling, I guess, to to the traditional forestry side or the pure forestry side of things. Um, so thinking of that, I guess you started your journey and then looking at your career, you worked at a couple of different places. I, I believe you even had your own woodlot at some point and then uh, worked quite a bit with Landvest. So maybe introduce our listeners to who Landvest is, because I believe there's a, a luxury, luxury real estate component, but also a Timberland side. But what can you tell us about Landvest? Yeah, we do have a luxury real estate uh, component. Uh, we market high-end uh, luxury second homes uh, along the coast of Maine, Boston, um, all over New England, uh, up into the Adirondacks and around Lake Champlain. Uh, and then the other half of our business is forest management and consulting. We currently manage about 2 million acres of forest land from Southwest Pennsylvania through the Northern tip of Maine. The vast majority of that land is privately held, uh, either through high net worth individuals, farmers, small woodlot owners, uh, also some timberland investment management organizations, REITs. Uh, so the whole gamut of ownership and the gamut of, of par- parcel size from 50 acres on the low end to 850,000 acres on the high end. Wow. Wow. So large land base there at 2 million acres there spread across geographic diverse areas. And, and for our listeners and viewers, if, if for fun, you're bored, not that they were ever bored and looking for more screen time, I definitely encourage you to look at the land that's luxury real estate side because I get a kick every time it crosses my social media. They're beautiful homes, ones I could never afford to be clear, but they're amazing to look at, you know, these huge homes, you know, on a hilltop or something overlooking some water and just absolutely gorgeous homes. And uh, so very, very cool to watch there. Um, so thinking of of your role at uh, Landvest right now, can you maybe describe to our listeners 
how you got to be where you are because I suspect a lot of maybe younger foresters, you know, they're boots on the dirt, right? And maybe they they they're not even thinking about being an executive, and and you're you're pretty much you know at that executive level as uh, with your peers. And maybe tell us that journey. Like, did you think that you would you would be where you are today? Looking back, maybe when you started your forestry career. Certainly not. I, I started after college. I spent a couple of summers working out west doing inventory on national forests. Uh, you know, covered a lot of ground in Washington, Montana, Idaho, Missouri. Uh, then I, you know, came back from out west and worked for a small consulting forestry shop in a small town in northwest Pennsylvania. I got to know a couple of the partners there through college, and I worked there for a couple of years. Started to, decided to start my own business in 1996 uh, and had my own business for about seven years managing small wood lots around the same region. That got me into a little bit more business sense and, and managing books and, and uh, managing time and, and those sorts of things. I then went to work for a, a sawmill in uh, north central Pennsylvania, Matson Lumber, managing their company owned 30,000 acres, as well as procuring timber uh, to feed the mills. And then in uh, 2007, I came to work at Landvest as the Pennsylvania Regional Forester. We, uh, Landvest had acquired the management of a, a large tract of timberland in, in north central Pennsylvania. It was owned by a uh, college endowment investment. So it really exposed me to financial reporting uh, and, and that sort of work that was important to keep that client happy. Uh, they were they were as much focused on on that part of it as on forest management. Um, so it, you know that for the first time I had employees and and learned to manage uh, those challenges and then it's just been sort of a natural progression uh, up through uh, several different job titles to my current position. Um, and you know it, it wasn't really anything that I sought, but I, we're a small enough company that. If you focus on doing your job well, you get recognized for it and and then asked to to move up. So that's that's been my path. Yeah, very cool. Well, I guess at the end of the day, the the same old rule of thumb works, put your head down, work hard, you know, do great work and and you'll be recognized by your leaders. Although I chuckled when you said as you have employees and 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 dealing with those challenges, I always love hearing how people describe the the people side of things, which is mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the most entertaining, exciting, or frustrating parts of, of being a, a leader. Now, you had mentioned within the, the Timberland side of things, there was the, the services side and the forestry consulting. And when we look at the website, uh, you know, one way I guess I would describe it to uh, someone maybe not in forestry, it's like maybe full service shop, like there's pretty much everything that you guys, you guys do. Is there a particular part of the business, maybe as we think about through time over the last maybe 20 years to where we are now, there's been a transition, maybe one that's intentional or one you've, you've seen, or maybe one that's kind of taken shape by external factors. What can you describe about your technology journey, I guess, from the, the early days? And again, I know you're not uh, an old grandfather, but in terms of you know, your career, you're, you're well 20, 30 years, right, in this business, if not more. But what can you share to our listeners in terms of what the world looked like back in the early days as it comes to technology? Yeah, so it's been 30 years uh, and it's been an amazing transition, really. You know, my early work was compass and paper maps and pacing and, uh, and you know, all day, nothing but that for navigation and dead reckoning and uh, it, it, and recording on paper. And, you know, in, in my, once I, you know, landed in a full-time job, that company had a handheld data recorder. And it was about, we called it the brick. It was about the size and the weight of a brick. Uh, but it worked. It worked every single day. The battery lasted all day. Had a heater in it to keep the battery from, uh, from going dead too fast. And that really introduced me to the efficiencies involved in technology and I've never looked back. I mean, we, you know, as soon as I had my own business, I could afford to buy a handheld a data recorder. I did, and uh, and maybe it doesn't save a ton of time in the woods, but it saves a ton of time in the office. And we always like to say, you make the money in the woods. Uh, you send the invoice from the office, but you but you have to be efficient in the woods. And so I, you know, spending the time in the woods is the, is the key. Uh, and then from there, it's just you know the the 
curve of tech technology advancement is so steep that it just happens daily. And uh, you know now we're on to you know navigating using a tablet, and that's an integrated uh, with force inventory software, and then that's integrated with the force management software. And uh, you know we're looking into other technologies, and, and the tools that our foresters use now are so much different. And we're using uh, Hagloff uh, 360s with the, both the sonar and laser distance measuring devices, and there's so many functions of that. Uh, and uh, the, the foresters enjoy it, uh, and they you know it, it enjoy having those efficiencies in their daily schedule. Uh, you know, I've added up the cost of the technology that any one of our foresters may be carrying in a day, and it's it's roughly six to seven thousand uh, dollars of electronics. And and you know, there's potential failures that come along with that. Uh, so they know how to get out of the woods with a compass and a map, or at least uh, a PDF map on their on their phone. Uh, but uh, but but day to day, that that's what's created efficiencies and allows them to to do their job well. Yeah, yeah, amazing. I, it makes me think of uh, I remember at a uh, an SAF, a Society of American Foresters conference way back, I think Steve Weiland, when he was writing for them, he was tasked with uh, presenting on what forestry might look like or or a digital forest or what they might look like. And he had the, you know, the the lightning EV truck and, you know, the forester gets out with his tablet and then a drone comes off the back bed and then he's got all this gear. And, and, and I think, I think this is maybe 10 years ago. And I think some of us or quite a few people might've had a chuckle going like, that's not going to happen. But as you've described, you know, it might, it's probably pretty bang on maybe minus the, the Ford lightning or whatever, uh, you know, big uh, truck, uh, the battery side of things, but it's quite fascinating there. So thinking of that, that journey, maybe from, you know, the, the way things were, because believe it or not, you know, when my kids, uh, you know, they'll do some orienteering work and then, you know, they'll, they'll actually have a compass. And I remember the first time they, they held one, they're like, what, like, what the hell is this dad? I'm like, it's called a compass kid. And like, what do you mean? What the hell is this? And they're like, like, isn't there an app on my smartphone to do that? I'm like, no, it's like, you need to learn these like basic skills. Right. And that was an eye opener, but thinking of that, that, that journey from where things were to now, would you say there were some key definitive moments, uh, core technologies that really, uh, move the, the industry forward? Or do you think it was just maybe just a gradual or perpetual innovation or continuous innovation, um, at play. What, what what's your thesis, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's been a, a little bit of a roller coaster. There's been some ups and downs with a you know steady improvement, but you know some of the older stuff worked better, uh, to be honest. You know, and including on software. Uh, and you know that, like I said, that brick was rugged. It worked, and it and it was all keypad entry, no touch screen, no tap screen. Uh, and you know it worked every day. And that has come and gone a little bit. Touch screen's a little harder to use in weather. You know, raindrops falling on them, snow landing on them. You know, we work in temperature ranges from minus 40 to plus 90. And that technology uh, can't always do that. Uh, I had a, a forester call me a few years ago and said, my handheld won't work. I said, what's the temperature? She said, minus 40. And I said, well, maybe you shouldn't be working. And she said, no, I, I want to work. And so she went to the, uh, to the convenience store and got some of those hand warmers and stuck them in the case behind the battery. And she got her work done that day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, so you know, that, that's, tech, that's been a limiting factor. I think it's also there was a, a as GPS, you know, came on board, uh, it, it, it moved from its own device to be incorporated with other devices. Some of those were pretty darn accurate. And uh, now tablets and phones that are the standard aren't as accurate as some of those uh, devices that we used 10 years ago. So now we're supplementing those with Bluetooth, you know, GPS antennas at a much higher cost. Uh, but, you know, so it, it's, it's been some give and take, um, uh, you know, through the years, but the, the, and, and memory becoming so cheap. And, you know, my first, I'm going to really date myself here. My first hard drive had a 10 megabyte, or my first computer had a 10 megabyte hard drive. And uh, I would have to unload programs to, re to upload other programs to, and it was all in five and a quarter floppy. So it was, a, you know, if I wanted to do word processing, I might have to clear the program out to do something else and 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 then switch back. So the, the, the cost and the capacity of, of computers is, I mean, 
that's been the the, the stalwart and the baseline of everything. You know, first people cost four thousand dollars and it didn't do anything. And uh, color monitor meant I could switch from black and white to yellow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think some of our listeners are probably one either asking what is a, a five and a quarter floppy disk there. Then there's probably another group going like five and a five and a quarter. You weren't in the three and a half, uh, you know, days. Like what's five and a quarter was before three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's, that's amazing. And obviously, I'm dating myself since I remember those things as well. Uh, but I guess maybe I'd be curious to know your thoughts, like your your comments around, you know, there was technology back that worked. It was rugged, purpose built. Um, some of it, as you said, might have worked better than what's generally available. One one might think that those companies would have doubled down or tripled down. You know, they've got something good and 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 expanded their portfolio and made that brick, you know, maybe lighter or maybe a different color or something. What what happened to those companies or why do you? I, I'm assuming they're not around anymore. But what what what's your thoughts on maybe why why they they went away? Is it just economies of scale, unit costs of consumer market things, or do you think there's some other reason or some other factors at play? I think it's those things, and we've been we've heard through the grapevine that you know the mold for an injection mold of the of the housing of the device, the mold alone is fifty thousand dollars. Well, that's a lot of units you got to sell to recover that cost, and that's probably a limiting factor in our sector. Now, I, I don't really understand why technology from other sectors couldn't be uh, used in the forest industry, and we really don't see it that much. There are and maybe it's the it's the climate and uh, you know issues that are are a problem. But you know a lot of inventory work is done in retail stores and grocery stores electronically. And you know the devices could be the same except for the the ruggedness that we need on a daily basis. So maybe that's been the limiting limiting factor is just making it rugged. I mean those there are devices out there that are rugged. Um, you know and, and we buy some of them. Uh, it's just they are they're expensive and we found that you know some of the middle of the road tablets that are rugged uh, in air quotes uh, are almost disposable about four hundred dollars which you don't want to throw in four hundred dollars but a day's data on that device is more valuable than device itself and uh, as long as we can recover the data and we can keep those in stock you know we keep them on hand replace them when they get damaged and we don't get upset about it we just hand off a new one and get back to work. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. The data on the device is more for that day is more valuable. The device itself. Love that saying. That's a powerful saying. But also I think then on the Landvest website, you got to add the third pillar that you have the best buy arm. So if you're keeping all these tablets in stock, you can go ahead and like basically service, sell, sell them to your forcers and, and game them. But, uh, but love forcers hearing their stories because again, you're, your example there with like the the pocket warmers, I guess, you know, like breaking yeah. them off that normally use for steam, right? And the forcer thinking, oh, like just put these in the back. Just ingenious. Forcers are just ingenious all the time. Always amazed. So I'd be curious, I mean, maybe take us down a little path, just given what's happening in my neck of the woods and, and getting your thoughts. And then we'll, we'll maybe do a little detour and then come back um, to the technology side. Since again, you being an exec, I know you're, you're always thinking time horizons that are different than the average Joe or Jane. Uh, so in my neck of the woods, we were talking before this call, you know, we've got fires in Quebec, you know, BC, Alberta, just the gong show and even East coast Canada. And then I think uh, in the U S uh, Northeast, maybe a couple fires, fired, nothing significant major yet, but still early. But the, the themes I want to kind of get your thoughts on is one with your portfolio of clients, climate is obviously, I suspect a key discussion point or maybe one that's constantly rearing its head and uh, as well with your your ESG commitments and and all that stuff um what's your outlook I guess on what how you're viewing the landscape now you know with all these fires happening on happening is this just something that we knew was bubbling you know the scientists saying the frequency of these extreme events are going to happen more and and I know a lot of foresters have very strong opinions and passions on the role of forester and forestry in mitigating some of these climate change. But how much do you, does your organization and your clients talk climate and, and, and is it maybe one of the number one topics for you these days versus the traditional, you know, timber and, and how you're going to get it uh, out of the woods and, and to market? 
It, it is a big subject of conversation. We don't worry too much about fire in the forest that we manage. There may be some small one-off fires started by a electric line or a, a, we had a railroad spark a few years ago in Pennsylvania, but not large scale. It, it just, it's, it's typically, it's mostly hardwood forest. It's high moisture content. You know, it, it, in the property, the, the southernmost property that we manage in Pennsylvania, the average is, uh, is eight fire days a year. So unlikely that there's actually an ignition source in that same time frame. And uh, there are fires, but not significant. Although, you know, New Jersey Pine Barrens just had 50,000 acres burn uh, last week. Uh, different, different uh, you know, forest type altogether. And the forests don't count on fire. I mean, that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that there are tree species that do not regenerate without a fire. The cones don't open, so therefore the seed doesn't come out unless it's heated. The mineral soil needs to be exposed, so the duff needs to be uh, eliminated so that the seed makes contact with that mineral soil and germinates. That's you know typically softwood forest, but the side of the climate discussion that we are having every day is about carbon and the forest's ability to sequester and store carbon and all of the implications that come along with that. And we're, we are seeing a shift in uh, a reduction in uh, harvest uh, levels that our, our clients are more focused on maintaining or uh, sequestering more carbon on their forests. So they want to reduce harvest levels to do that. And many of them are able to monetize that. Uh, through a carbon development project with one of the big uh, carbon developers. So it's a, a big part of what we do. Uh, and we have focused on inventory uh, subject to carbon protocols. And we've been doing that as long as anybody. Uh, we, you know, these forests need to be uh, re-inventoried every six years for the carbon protocols. And we are on our third inventory uh, for some properties, uh, same property. So, you know, we've been doing it for 12 or more years, uh, the forest inventory part of it. Uh, that's a very difficult inventory, very strenuous, uh, detailed measurements uh, that, that have to be done right to pass the verification and allow our clients to, to sell that uh, carbon value. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And I know I've chatted with a few you know, folks on the, the carbon space, and I'd be curious to know, um, you know, probably maybe a month or two, even in terms of the verification side of things, there is a bit of, uh, I don't want to say hoopla, if that's the right word, but but bit of uh, uh, consternation around, simply put, who's right, I guess, in terms of some of these numbers. And with your boots on the ground, I guess, uh, from what I'm hearing, it's like, you're not necessarily always looking at, you know, some advanced magical technology to solve the problem, but traditional cruising, I'm assuming, and doing that that work. But what are your thoughts on the the state of the carbon market and the readiness of it? Is some of the people's concerns, um, especially as we invoke, you know, ESG and then, you know, the the the, the washing or whatever washing term you want to use. Do you, do you think there's still a lot of room to go or do you think we're, we're pretty much in a good space uh, on that front? I think there's some room to go. I, I, I think the options available to landowners to market their carbon are challenging options. It's a long, long-term commitment. And you know, on the short end, it's 40 years. On the long end, it's 100 uh, of, of a commitment. Now, you know, forests are managed for long-term benefits, and we make, but we make decisions every single day that may last 100 years. And if you're locked into a, into a commitment for that sort of time frame, your options may be limited. And and People may be willing to commit for their own lifetime or their next generation, but to schedule out three, two, three generations of commitment is, is difficult. Uh, so I'd love to see a shorter term carbon development uh, come out. Uh, there, there have been some shorter ones. They didn't hold up, uh, and, but I think there's still room for that you know, 10 to 20 year commitment that people could probably um, really get behind. Um, right. Maybe the carbon value is lower, but that's okay. I mean, that that's the decision the landowner wants to have. They want to have options. And um, so uh, I'd love to see something in that 
in that. Yeah. Way. Yeah. So I, I'm hearing from you. It's almost like the people, your clients, like they're coming to the table with some of these concerns and, and thinking about it, which, which is great to hear. And, and I know when you mentioned, you know, there might be like one or two or three generations. Um, I'm just curious whether those are successfully agreed upon. Is there a pattern where you, you've got multiple generational people at the table thinking that way or, or, or is it just all over the place? It could be, you know, one generation making that decision for future ones. Is there a certain pattern just out of curiosity and what works? I don't think there's any pattern. It's all, all of the above. Uh, you know, we, we've had a experience, long-term experience with a client that was, um, you know, a, a single individual making most of the decisions. He's since passed and his sons have taken over the ownership and they're making different decisions. Uh, and, you know, the first, you know, they're making decisions that were talked about a few years ago, but, but they were never enacted. Uh, and I think that newer generations think about, they've come up differently. They've heard, been exposed to different uh, things and different concerns and different environmental discussions. And, and they think a little differently. And, and so they want to explore all those options. So it, it, it's uh, you know it's a hot topic. Yeah, I, f I feel like there's a lot of handholding involved in in those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, a lot of warnings posted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so thinking of the business, if we if we come back to maybe the technology, the the central theme of this, um, I'm going to assume there's some GIS technology at play, remote sensing. What can you tell us about? Some of the core technologies that that Landvest uh, uses to drive its business is it that different than other companies, you know, using Esri technology or or things like that, or is there some um, special special sauce that that you guys are driving? Uh, I don't think it's uh, any different. I mean, we're certainly leveraging the Esri technologies. Um, you know, we have a four person uh, GIS shop that they're focused on uh, maintaining and managing our uh, geo database and all that goes with that. Uh, traditionally, we've built our own database programs in-house. Uh, we have one individual who's quite skilled at building database applications. I think the number is 17 applications that he's wow. that he's been that he's built over the years. Uh, they've served us extremely well. They're all access based. Uh, they've served us well, but the problem, a couple problems. One is there's one person who is you know charged with maintaining those, that's risky. Uh, the second is that when you build something yourself, like a database, it will do exactly what you built it to do. And it may do that extremely well, but it never exposes you to something you didn't know you could do. And so we've shifted over the last four years to buying off the shelf programs that uh, are customizable to suit our needs. And my mantra in that, those decisions, and not just about software and hardware, but also about people, is making decisions that could take us in a direction we didn't know we could go. And ultimately, that's what's led us to this conversation, Kevin. Is we've, and we've also found that partnering with a company, choosing the team is just as important as choosing the product. And you know, that's where you know, we've gotten to know Lim Geomatics, got to know you and, and your folks. And that's the type of team that we've wanted to partner with for years. And we finally found what we feel is the right, you know, slot for us. You guys are going in directions we didn't know we could go. And we're along for the ride. And it, that comes from you being exposed to all those other clients that ask for things. And that turns on the light bulb in, in your heads. And then that makes that available to us. That's something we didn't think about. So we're able to think outside of our own organization by connecting to uh, companies and, and people that, you know, like you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And, and, and sometimes uh, maybe we get stuck in, in doing how things we've always done them. And, and sometimes we need a jolt from the, the, the side. Yeah. I remember there's some meetings where even sometimes even smaller, like just even having four people from four different companies, you know, not a tremendous big user group in itself was powerful because of the cross fertilization of ideas and, and connecting, you know, one plus one equals three without even realizing that when you're thinking it was two. And I kind of chuckle because, you know, as a leader, um, at some point, is it really about the technology or is it really building the best team and having the best team and the best people? You got to have good technology, but maybe with the best team, 
you know, even with good technology, you can do great things. I don't know. I always joke on my side, my analogies comes down to building a house, uh, you know, building a sports team or building a car, one of those three. And beyond that, uh, I, I have no analogies. But thinking of that journey, it's fascinating. So going from the custom, and I think a lot of li- our, of our listeners are either still building custom applications, some are full caught, and then some are maybe, you know, the configure uh, first before the buy scenario. Was that change of thinking uh, something driven from you and your leadership and executive role? Or would you say... Uh, uh, on one side, smooth sailings. Everybody jumped on board and said, "Steve, this is a great idea. Let's 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 forget about our 17 access databases and go this way." What what fun stories we'll call them that? Can you share with us in that journey of creating that transformation or that that change within Landvest? Yeah, I uh, I think it came from me. Uh, you know, when I took this position four years ago, and that's when we started uh, the transition. Uh, it it came from attending a conference. Uh, four years ago, and to learn about a, a, you know a log management software and a settlement uh, you know so, log settlement process uh, software, and I was exposed at that point in time to all the other things that have been attached to this software. That like oh we can do that well you know think about the efficiency that that adds to our business and you know we're we're moving thirty thousand loads of forest products every year and somebody handwrites a ticket to a, a shoe associated with every one of those truck loads that can go away and how do we get to that going away because it's 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 very difficult to find people it's very difficult to train people that's very expensive and i think you know if we can you know remove some of the mundane tasks that people have to accomplish every day to make their lives easier, I mean, that's that's the direction we need to be going. And, um, and and so that, you know, just sort of exposed to it once. And then it's like, well, if that can do this, then, you know, the world's our oyster. We can be asking other things. And Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm sensing or hearing, you know, workforce is also, I think everybody I've talked to uh, ever were having uh, a, a good workforce, a talented workforce, one that's constantly you know, people coming in, staying, moving on and whatnot. It sounds like that that's a, a challenge for, for you as well as everyone else, it seems like, in the industry. It is, yeah. Uh, we have 65 employees in, in the Forest Resources Division. Um, we always have an opening. Uh, we <laughs> And so uh, sometimes it's it's too many openings and, and keeping uh, good people, engaging good people is uh, is the number one challenge uh, that we face these days. And I think it's, you know, curiosity somewhat. I think people want to try different things and, you know, so do I. Uh, I don't want to try too many new things now, uh, but, uh, but you know, so if they stay two or three years, they want to go try something else. And, uh, but, but recently we've been able to attract a few back, which has been really been big wins for us. They, they worked for us for a little while, went off and explored something and realized the grass wasn't greener. And uh, we're and when we had the opportunity to welcome them back, they had come back stronger than they left, and you know with a renewed passion for what they do, and um, and you know one in, a couple of them into different roles than, than they were originally in, and and they're just we're getting more than we bargained for out of, out of, out of a couple of people that came back, and um, so you know it, it's it's that's that's a challenge. The number one challenge is to is to find and retain. Uh, good talent. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I suspect often um, it's not just the financial lever. I don't know if your experience is like ours, where we'll have very young staff that that say, you know what, thanks for this opportunity, but I'm going to try something else. And then, you know, in a friendly way, like, oh, well, what's the next thing? And the answer is, I'm going camping. And I'm like, yeah. okay, great. But what, what are you doing after camping? Uh, I don't know. It's I'll figure it out. So, which is kind of like, don't most people figure it out first and then do the camping and then they go to the next <laughs> thing, but it, it's just so different. And, mm-hmm. and I know one time we talked a couple months ago, you, you, you folks were really big on doing the community outreach and going to the schools and, and creating, you know, special days where you can bring the students out to the, the, the woods, the field. Has, has that been a, a recipe that that's led to success or, or, or has it 
kind of partially achieved or our or has it really created something that's uh, a nice funnel for people coming in? I'm just curious to know with those uh, efforts, whether they're paying dividends. Yeah, I think it's a little early to tell. We've been doing it over the last couple of years. This year we did two, one in New Hampshire and one in Northern Maine. And a, a total attendance of eight to 900 high school students at those two events. Eight to 900? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so big oh. events, uh, all day, you know, and many booze, and, and what's, you know, it's a little difficult for us, and, and we were able to, to uh, control it a little better this year, but last year at the one in New Hampshire, we were next to the mini excavator demo. Well, the kids are really interested to see that mini excavator. They don't want to come over to our booths and talk about forestry, so we were able to say, well, we don't want to be next to the equipment this year, and uh, so I think we got a lot more interest and a little more uh discussion, a more intimate conversation with a few. Uh, I let the younger folks in the company uh, do these things, uh, attend these things. I think they connect better to high school students than I do. And uh, so I encourage them to, to get out there. I did it when I was younger uh, and you know, spoke in, in schools and elementary schools. It's too early to tell whether we've had any impact. I, I hope we have. Um, and, and really, we, we aren't expecting to say, this person's gonna be the next land rest employee. We're trying to inspire and influence young people to get into the forestry sector, and that will help us someday. You know, it may be some other company that benefits from our participation, but we may benefit from somebody else's. And we look at diversity the same way that we, you know, there's not a lot of diversity in schools in New England. And we'd love to have more opportunities for diversity in the forestry sector we probably can't influence that significantly in New England. So we'll do what we can here. Maybe we'll inspire another company to do something somewhere else. And at some point in time, we'll all benefit from that. Right, right. Yeah, ab absolutely, 100%. And uh, yeah, no, fascinating to hear that you, you don't know what the the ROI, if we even call it that is, but as opposed to like a greater good and and you know, maybe it'll create, spark a couple collision, collisions here or there, or alternatively, you guys just need to buy a big machine and deck it out with land vests, swag and the cows and you'll have like everybody coming, right? And give right. Them a, a new heads up display or something and, and have some fun with that. So so thinking of the workforce, looking forward at, at some other technologies, every time we hear about workforce, people start talking about AI. What, mm -hmm. what does AI mean to, to you? And again, as your seat, uh, you know, at the table, a pie in land vest, is that something that, that the leadership's thinking about and how it could benefit or maybe disrupt forestry further? Or is it too early um, and you want to see how things uh, unfurl in other sectors with AI? What, what does AI mean to, to you and land vest? I don't think it's too early. And we're investigating opportunities. We have worked on one uh, AI ML uh, project. It was a, a forest piping uh, project where all of the data was uh, publicly sourced, uh, and you know stand lines and stand types were applied to a million acre forest. Um, it was. It may not be perfect. It was high value because the cost was low compared to the traditional methods. Uh, so you have to understand what the product is. It was interesting process for the foresters involved. They had to rethink because we're not looking at the aerial photos ourselves. We're talking about how to teach a computer to do it and computers thinking binary. And so it had to make one decision at a time and we have to de develop the order of operations for those decisions. It's most important to divide these two things first, software, hardware, fall short. When you look at an aerial photo as a forester, traditionally, all that pops out of your head at once. Oh, there's the stand line. You don't think about, well, those are taller, those are shorter, those are software hardware. You just know it. That the computer doesn't know that. So it was a very interesting project for us to get involved in. And I think on the inventory side is where we're going to see uh, more technology, the use of drones, with sensors. Uh, I, I just attended a couple of conferences over the last two weeks and got exposed to some technology that I didn't know was available yet. Uh, and, you know, being able to count trees with a drone image, that's what it's all about. You know, then, the, you know, we can go out and measure trees and create a sample of 
some of those measurements. And then the accuracy comes from the accurate count of trees. If that can be accurate from a drone, uh, that's great. Uh, we're willing to invest in those technologies moving forward. If it's uh, you know a clear return on investment, I think the speed at which we can deploy uh, an inventory could happen um, faster if we had some technology like that. You know, pulling a team of foresters together to travel to a far off land and execute a project is it's a that's a project in and of itself is to get them all together uh, and get it all to happen. So if it's just one or two with a drone and then some calibration with some plots on the ground, boots on the ground, that may be uh, in some circumstances may be a very efficient way to deploy inventory projects. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I feel like after this podcast, you're going to get inundated by job applicants or drone vendors who want to sell this or, 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 or EV truck makers, who knows, but uh, you'll have to tell me how, how that goes forward. So fascinating to hear the, the technology kind of, you know, you're thinking about it, what it could mean uh, for forestry. And, and I'm wondering before we shift into maybe the far future, um, are there any pro tips you would give other foresters or forestry companies trying to start their journey with digital transformation for lack of lack of better word or or I, I hate modernizing because it makes it sound like you're kind of in the dark ages as opposed to you're consciously choosing to to look at how you've been doing business and strategically choosing certain areas to focus on and maybe you know add a little bit of grease here and 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 make things run smoother but are there any speed bumps that that you ran into that you think back and go like gee whiz it's like had I known that I could have could have saved myself maybe a lot of pain or my people a lot of pain. But is there a a Steve Hawks top three uh, things you should think about before you you start going down this path of embracing new technology? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, one I already said is that the team is as important as the product, and uh, I stand by that. Uh, we we've, we've learned from the mistakes in the past uh, and not choosing the right team, even though the product may have been, you know, at the time, a better product. Um, providing, you know, honest feedback, uh, you know, to your vendors or potential vendors. The, you know, the technology turns over so fast, as we've discussed, that you don't know, you know, in three to five years, you may be looking to replace the technology you bought three to five years ago. And providing feedback to the second place you know, vendor in, in your selection process may pay off for you. Uh, that has worked for us. And then early on, and maybe it's still true, screen caps equal dollar sum. So every time you touch the screen, it costs you money. So the more efficient you can get the data into the device, whatever device that is, uh, the, the more efficient it will be. I can't tell you what the dollar sign amount is, but just think about that. You know, if you want to compare two products, it took me 20 taps to enter this tree on this device and this product. And on this one, it took 12. Well, if you're measuring several hundred trees a day, multiply that out. And that that's real money. Um, I don't believe any of the devices, any of the hardware devices that we've purchased over the last five, 10 years have not panned out. The devices have been good. They've all saved us time, saved us money. Um, you know, it doesn't take long to justify the cost of a $2,500 device if you get a few more plots done in a day. And, you know, in, in carbon inventory where they really pay off, it's only a couple of plots a day that, you know, a plot a day over several days and you paid for it. And, um, and, and you know, trust but verify. When you, when you shift to technology, electronic measuring devices, they're going to give you a result. You've still got to use your head. You've still got to look at that number and say, there's no way that tree is as tall as the device it tells me it is. Something went wrong. Um, you can't just rely on that without uh, you know, giving it the check. 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. I love that that thinking because it always reminds me back when GPS, you know, came out and we we're using them in cars and you'd see the newspaper, you know, some schmo drove down the stairs or something. And, you know, as great as the technology is, like we still have brains and we need to leverage them, right? We can't, you right. know, follow ourselves with that de decision making. Um, so, so as we kind of look forward, I know Apple just recently did like an announcement. They've got their, uh, what is it called? Vision Pro augmented reality, like, you know, fantastic product precision, right? Like how to avoid uh, augmented reality, the term virtual reality, all the the pluses and minuses, maybe that comes with a term. And they came up with spatial computing and, and this headset. And it's not cheap. It's like, I think 3,500 bucks or something. Um, but clearly they're thinking in the future, just as others have, have, have tried. Um, what would be your comment to other leaders maybe that are thinking about this, that might look at like this, this Apple device or, or whatever the device is and maybe shrug it off or laugh it off. Like Apple's Apple's a big player, and but you know, others have tried it, you know, Google Glasses and other things like that. But in your experiences in your career of the day, and again, sitting at that that you know, vice president level, that that C suite level, um, how do you take that information? Like maybe walk us through, you know, when you see these announcements, like. Is it immediate excitement? Is it immediate, like, I don't know what to do with it. I need to like ask others or, or, or is it like a, a, a puzzle piece has just fallen in place for you in, in, in this, this thing you're working in your head, like, like walk us through the thinking there as you, as these announcements come, come out, what do you, what do you do with that information uh, at, at your level? Yeah, I, I guess I tiptoe into the water a little bit and, and I wait for it to settle out. You know, I, I, a, you know, the early conversations about this technology are often way over my head and to be honest. So I, I sort of wait till it gets dumbed down to my level. And then people are talking about how it can apply to the forest industry or a similar industry. I have a couple people on, on my staff who are always looking at these things. Our, our director of GIS and our director of inventory and analytics, they're both very techy and, and they are always looking at these products and technologies and and they're thinking the same way. They're thinking, how can this benefit us? Um, and whether it's now or it's, we better keep an eye on this one for a little while and, and see where it goes. You know, it, Apple has been successful. Uh, so when they, you know, come up with a new technology or a new way of thinking, you're going to get on board at some point in time. It's sooner or later, you got to get on the train because the train's going down the, the track. And that's the direction where we headed. Apple, Google, the other real innovators uh, in technology, they're going to take us a direction and, and we have to learn how to adapt to it and, and use it to, to improve our lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things I've been trying to figure out is, um, and it's a broad theme of just how, how media communicates the things because even with this announcements from apple right away i think you know on 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 the twitter verse there was like oh obviously no one's ever worn this thing for for 12 hours i think implying that ergonomically it's probably not um comfortable but and even as we thought about you know elon and his you know his big uh starship taking off and then you know blew up and um and mainstream media is saying it's a, a failure and stuff and then reality they actually look at that story um the goal was not to blow up the the launch pad like anything other than that was fine and it was actually blown up intentionally because they were stressing the the ship to figure out what was going on so it actually went all according to plan despite what the mainstream media was saying and, and that part's always stuck with me because as foresters and learning about new technology where you consume this information, I think really, really matters because if you're just listening to certain sources of truth, you might get a different view just as, you know, the Starship blowing up and thinking that was a bad thing. Are there any trusted sources that you go to? I know you said you go to a couple of conferences, but are there certain events that 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 are happening? Because I know uh, I, I know you're going out to the Association of Consulting Foresters. There's a SAF uh, technology conference in Baton Rouge in August. But is there a go-to thing that 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 you go to, or or is it really going to Zach or someone your directors saying, "Hey, what's going on here?" Any any for those who are looking or craving to learn more, uh, well, how would you advise them to go about finding the the latest and greatest in a in, in the best objective way possible? Yeah, I, I I like to attend the Association of Consulting Foresters conference as often as possible. Uh, it's in a great location this year, so in Eugene, Oregon. So I'm looking forward to the trip. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
you know, and we we do some business with Trimble. Uh, Trimble is a big, innovative company, 13,000 employees across the world. Just attended their user conference uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, a couple of weeks ago. I had been four years ago. The previous one, obviously, COVID interrupted the biannual. Um, learned a lot there. We are connected to uh, uh, hardware and, and software vendors that are informing us, hey, we got this new thing. Uh, you, you want to take it for a test drive. I, I like it, it, you know, and the vendors that, you know, just demo at these conferences are part of it, but also attending the conferences and talking to the other people there who had similar experiences or different experiences and finding out what works. I've, I've got a couple of people I call, uh, you know, what are you guys using these days, you know, and, uh, and they're going to give me an honest uh, response and, Maybe it doesn't change my mind, but at least I know what I'm getting into. Uh, and okay, well, that didn't work for you, but that doesn't mean it won't work for us in our systems. Uh, so just, you know, a little bit of reading, uh, you know, a few, you know, forestry source from SAF. Uh, I get an uh, RGIS uh, uh, magazine once a month that I don't even have an ARC license. Uh, GIS didn't exist in the it is the public sector when I was in, in college. They walked us through the GIS lab and said, this is the future, but it was all uh, military grade at the time. So I just, you know, staying plugged in and, and staying plugged in the people who are plugged in. For sure, for sure. Now, out of curiosity from left field, digital events, in-person events, what's your preference? Oh, in-person. <laughs> Absolutely in-person. And, uh, you know, you, the, the organic conversation doesn't happen in the digital events. We returned to the office. We didn't close offices. I don't worry about productivity. I worry about creative uh, by not being in the same room. And, you know, I, I know stories that of, of innovators who design their offices to have the people around the outside, but all the core central functions of the office were in the middle. So you had to walk by somebody else's desk to go to the bathroom, to go get a cup of coffee, to go get a snack. And something might be discussed in that conversation that you might think that's interruptive of the day, but maybe you have 30 seconds of brainstorming that takes you in a direction you didn't know you could go. And so, you know, I think being back together uh, is important. And so I'm, I'm fully on board with going back to conferences and seeing old friends and having a beer and shaking hands. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Focus on productivity, not focus on productivity, but focus on creativity. Yeah, I think that's maybe a forcer's DNA. This virtual thing just, just uh, don't don't work so so good. It, it did its job when we needed to do, but yeah, it's time to you know go back to full full normal. Yeah. So as we look to to wind out, I, I you know I definitely thank you for giving up your giving me an hour of your time because I know you're you're a super busy guy. Um, as we wind down, I'm just curious. Uh, you know, we talked about your career, your journey, and and what what's the future look for you? Like you're at a VP level now. I know you mentioned it kind of came about. Uh, is there is there a next step? Uh, you know, as we mature, as we say it, right? Mature versus mature. You know, we start thinking about different things. But what's the outlook for for Stephen Hawks, VP of Forest Resources, look like? What's uh what's the next uh, mountain you want to climb, or dragon you want to slay, or or is there there's something that uh, that you want to get done uh, in the not so far far uh, future? Yeah, I think it's um, more about providing the the right tools for our staff. Uh, I I say my number one job is to provide the resources to let them do their job well. Um, and you know, there's a military say, saying that I think is uh, bo boots, bullets, and chow. And so, you know, we, you know, I think that's right is, um, you know, work hard, play hard, uh, create a company culture that is inviting and welcoming and, and accepting. Um, we like to work hard and, but, you know, we like to have some fun together. So that's, that's been a great experience and I'd like to do more of that. Um, I don't really have any, you know, personal goals beyond knocking down a few hurdles, you know, as far as advancement in my career. Uh, I love my job most days. Um, I would love to eliminate the paper trick ticket. Uh, as I said, uh, I don't think that's a reality, but to greatly reduce uh, the data entry, the manual data entry, 
uh, is is a big goal, and I think that is achievable um, and in a short time. I mean, we've got the foundation built. That's an, an, a major next step for us, and uh, looking forward to moving in that direction. For sure, for sure. Well, for those folks who want to get a hold of you, what's the the best way? Is it email? Is it LinkedIn? Is it website? How how do folks uh, follow up with you if they they want to reach out to to as a vendor, as as someone looking for new opportunities, or someone seeking guidance or advice? How uh, how's the best way to get a hold of you, Steve? Email is the best. Uh, email is s h a w k e s at landvest.com. I am not into social media, so I uh, I have a LinkedIn page, and obviously you pointed out that it's out of date. So uh, I. <laughs> That tells you how often I keep up with it. Uh, so email is uh, the best way to get a hold of me, and I'm happy to respond and and talk to you to anybody, and particularly young folks considering getting into forestry and, and uh, might need a little nudge or or want to hear, uh, you know, what it really is. Yeah, for sure, love it absolutely. For our listeners, you know, we want to, you know, it's not often you get a VP who's uh, you know willing to spend time with you and have a conversation. So definitely encourage you to reach out to. To, to Steve and, uh, and, and, and tap into his experience and, and his knowledge. So Steve, thanks so much for joining uh, me on this podcast. Love the conversation. I'm sure we can chat for another hour, but definitely uh, the next time we'll, we'll be over a, a soda pop in hand in person versus this digital thing. But I just wanted to thank you for carving out some time for this guy. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you too. Awesome. Thanks. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.